For decades, the joke about Brazil has been that it's the country of the future and always will be. Despite enormous natural resources, it has long displayed an uncanny ability to squander its vast potential. Now, it's beginning to look like Brazil might have the last laugh. While most of the world is consumed with debt and unemployment, Brazil is trying to figure out how to manage an economic boom. It was the last country to enter the Great Recession, the first to leave it, and is poised to overtake France and Britain as the world's fifth largest economy. Its outgoing president may be the most popular politician on the planet, and with the World Cup and the Olympics on the way, Brazil is about to make its grand entrance on the global stage. The story will continue in a moment. When most people think of Brazil, they think of its passion and excellence in soccer. Not of skyscrapers in Sao Paulo, the financial hub of a fledgling economic superpower. They think of the pulsating beat of the samba and carnival, not commodities or the world's largest cattle industry. They see the beaches of Ipanema and Copacabana and breathtaking vistas. This is quite a view. Yes, incredible, huh? Not Brazilian tycoons like Ike Batista, who has the best view in Rio, not to mention a net worth of $27 billion. How do most Americans see Brazil? They think Buenos Aires is the capital of Brazil, so they mix us with other countries around South America. Most powerful country in, in South America? GDP-wise, we, we are bigger than all the other countries together. And, uh, you know, in the last 16 years, Brazil has put its act together. This is it. Hello, time for Americans to wake up. With most of the world's economy stagnant, Brazil's is growing at 7%, three times faster than America. It is a huge country, slightly larger than the continental U.S., with vast expanses of arable farmland, an abundance of natural resources, and 14% of the world's fresh water. 80% of its electricity comes from hydropower, it has the most sophisticated biofuels industry in the world, and for its size, the world's greenest economy. Brazil is already the largest producer of iron ore in the world, and the world's leading exporter of beef, chicken, orange juice, sugar, coffee, and tobacco, much of it bound for China, which has replaced the U.S. as Brazil's leading trade partner. And Brazil has the size to, to, to match the China's appetite. You have it's everything. a big dragon on, on the other side. You have everything they need. They, we have, yes. You need the Brazil to, to, to basically fulfill the Chinese needs. Batista, who has interests in mining, transportation, and oil and gas, is building a huge superport complex north of Rio with Chinese investment that will accommodate the world's largest tankers and speed delivery of iron ore and other resources to Asia. But it's not just commodities that are driving the Brazilian boom. The country has a substantial manufacturing base and a large auto industry. Aviation giant Embraer is the world's third largest aircraft manufacturer behind Boeing and Airbus and a main supplier of regional jets to the U.S. market. Ike Batista says the one thing that Brazil could use more of is skilled labor. We have to create more engineers. In my oil company, I'm importing Americans to weld our platforms. To yeah. weld the platforms? Yes, there's a lack of welders. We're walking into a phase of almost full employment. This country has created almost 1.5 1, 1 million jobs this year already. It's unbelievable. Brazil has seen periods of prosperity before, only to have the bubbles burst. It spent billions in the 50s and 60s moving its capital to a barren savanna near the middle of the country where it built Brasilia, a futuristic city right out of the Jetsons. Then it borrowed billions more to develop the country's interior. Corruption and ineptitude eventually led to a financial collapse, 2,000% inflation, and at the time, the largest financial rescue package in the history of the International Monetary Fund. 
Then a few years later, this man walked into the president's office. Tem um país no planeta. President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, known simply as Lula, is a former metal worker with a fourth grade education and a doctorate in charisma. Camera filmando camera. When he was elected eight years ago on his fourth try, Lula was a firebrand labor leader with socialist tendencies. Some predicted another Hugo Chavez. But he's about to leave office with a 77% approval rating and much of the credit for turning the country around. We talked to him at the presidential residence in Brasilia. When you took office, there were many businessmen, both in Brazil and abroad, who were very nervous about you, who thought that you were a socialist and that you were going to take the country sharply to the left. Yet these people now are among your biggest supporters. How did that happen? Look, every once in a while, I joke that a metal worker with a socialist background had to become president of Brazil to make capitalism work here. Because we were a capitalist society without capital. And if you look at the bank's balance sheets for this year, you will see that the banks have never made so much money in Brazil as they have during my government. The big companies have never sold as many cars as they have during my government. But the workers have also made money. How have you managed to do that? I have found out something amazing. The success of an elected official is in the art of doing what is obvious. It is what everyone knows needs to be done, but some insist on doing differently. One thing obvious to Lula was the social and economic chasm separating Brazil's rich and poor. He gave the poor families a monthly stipend of $115 just for sending their children to school and taking them to the doctors. The infusion of cash helped lift 21 million people out of poverty and into the lower middle class, creating an untapped market for first-time buyers of refrigerators and cars. But he was also far friendlier to business than anyone expected, encouraging growth and development and maintaining conservative fiscal policies and tight banking regulations that left Brazil unscathed by the world financial crisis. Lula was the, the right man at the right time, it seems. You have to, uh, to admit it, you know. He's a, he's a kind of pop star. Eduardo Bueno is a colorful commentator and best-selling author of popular Brazilian history. What's his secret? He's a street wise, I guess you can say that. Uh, he, he knows people, he knows the feeling, he knows what they want, he knows how to deal with the, the rich. He, 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 he charms uh, President Obama. And he also charmed the international committees that awarded Brazil the 2016 Olympics and the World Cup of 2014, political victories that announced the country's arrival as an international player and will present some challenges for Brazil's next president. She is Dilma Rousseff, Lula's former chief of staff and his hand-picked successor, who was elected in October because he was ineligible for a third term. There are people that believe that once you were gone, Brazil may revert to its old ways. Will the momentum continue once you leave office at the end of the year? If there is something I am proud of, it is to have told my people that we are not second-class citizens, that we can get things done, we can believe in ourselves, and then people have started to believe. There are still some non-believers. Given its checkered record for living up to its promise, the rap against Brazil is that it lacks ambition. It's called the Brazilian way. Why do something today that you can pay someone to do the day after tomorrow? Brazilians put up with incredibly high taxes on almost everything, have a high tolerance for corruption, bureaucratic red tape, and according to Eduardo Bueno, harbor a secret love affair with incompetence. President Charles de Gaulle of France once said, <laughs> that Brazil is not a serious country. Uh, do you believe that? Is Brazil a serious country now? <laughs> it's not a serious country in several instances because they say that they're going to do something and then don't do something. Here in Rio de Janeiro, you can invite someone to your house, they say they're going to come and they then show up and they don't think it's, you uh, know, who cares? But how can you do business in a loose way? How can you run a country in a loose way? While many in Brazil's cities lust for first world status, the third world is never far away. 
For decades, Brazil ignored the festering slums known as favelas, which wrap around Rio, overlooking some of the most valuable real estate in the city. They have been staging areas for street crime against tourists and safe havens for drug gangs so well armed that they brought down a police helicopter a few years ago with heavy machine gun fire. Finally, after years of looking the other way, the military police have begun to move in. In recent weeks, some parts of Rio have been a battle zone, with drug traffickers burning buses near some of the sports venues. But so far, the police have pacified 13 of the most dangerous favelas, and there are 27 more to go. This is a revolution. I myself did not believe this three years ago. There is a solution for, the, for slums all over Brazil. But there are also some massive problems with infrastructure. If the road to Brazil's future is long and wide, it is also jammed with traffic and filled with potholes. 90% of the roads in the country are still unpaved, and in the cities there's not much in the way of public transportation. And already there are major delays in the building and renovating of stadiums for the 2014 World Cup. FIFA, the World Soccer Organization, says Brazil is way behind in making preparations for the World Cup. Will the country be ready? Look, first, we need to be careful about European perfectionism, because everything that happens here in the South, they think they know better than us. Well, the Europeans may put their minds at ease, because we will organize the most extraordinary World Cup ever. What they didn't make in 500 years, they want to make in four, because the World Cup is going to be in Brazil. Do you think they'll be ready? No, I don't think it's going to be ready, especially because Brazilians uh, don't mind to be late. You know, they think, ah, oh, it just got a little late, what's the problem? They're going to be planting the, the grass while the, the ball was already rolling. Whatever happens in Brazil, no one will be able to blame it on a lack of money. That's because 150 miles off the coast lie what are believed to be the largest discoveries of oil found anywhere in the world in the past 35 years. Petrobras, the state-owned oil company, is preparing to drill 20,000 feet below the surface of the Atlantic to reach oil fields that sit underneath layers of salt beds. This oil story is a trillion dollar story right in front of us here. What do the, the offshore oil discoveries do for Brazil? What do they mean for the country's future? Oh, it, it means, you know, we should be producing in excess of six million barrels a day. So it put us in, among the third, third, fourth largest producer in the world, massive exporter. President-elect Dilma joked that the oil discoveries were just the latest proof that God is Brazilian. And economists from Goldman Sachs, no less, have predicted that Brazil, along with Russia, China, and India, will dominate the world economy in the 21st century. If it happens, Brazil would be a different kind of superpower, one that would rather make love, not war. It has no nuclear arsenal, and aside from contributing a small number of troops to the Allied cause in 1944, Brazil hasn't fought a war since 1870. Why, why fight with all the pleasures, beach and sun, war? Forget it. <laughs> soccer? Let's watch a soccer game. <laughs> Let's go to the beach. <laughs> Let's drink a beer.